Hello everyone, so uh, this is uh, the lecture for chapter 4, uh, Predictive Maintenance. So, uh, <clears throat> we have seen uh, before, we have talked about predictive maintenance and preventive and corrective maintenance in the beginning of the class. And remember, actually, we said that uh, predictive maintenance uh, relies on uh, um, scientific approaches to predict failure. And we saw, for example, the, the, the example in which, for instance, a light, for example, a lamp. Uh, if you change the lamp every, for example, three years, then uh, you're doing preventive maintenance. If you wait for it until it, you, st you start seeing uh, the, the lamp flickering, then you're doing predictive. And if you wait until it fails, until it, you, you try to turn on and it doesn't turn on, then you're doing corrective. So uh, predictive maintenance basically measures and monitors uh, various system and component operating characteristics and compares these data with established and known standards and specifications in order to predict a failure. So it's basically you have to, to compare to data, you have to collect data and compare it to the previously set data and standards. Another name for it is condition-based maintenance, condition maintenance basically. On average, one-third of all maintenance activities in an industrial organization need to be of the predictive uh, nature. It's, uh, the reason why is because it saves a lot of money. Uh, if you can predict a failure before it takes place. So uh, uh, that's why it's actually it's, uh, it's important. But uh, the truth is, I mean, it's not really, I mean, one third, probably it's uh, less. And uh, it's mostly for uh, big and expensive machinery. Uh, like, for instance, uh, big motors, very high uh, horsepower motors, or for instance, uh, an example that uh, I put later is, for instance, oil wheels, the pumps for, 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 for oil wheels. So, uh, PDM evaluates the existing equipment condition, and based on a projected trend of the deterioration, failures are predicted and appropriate steps are taken. PDM discovers potential problems before the eye can see, the ear can hear, or the nose can smell. Uh, PDM requires a great investment in time, advanced technology, and well-trained maintenance professionals. So this is actually one thing, is that preventive maintenance is usually done by entry-level technicians, but predictive maintenance needs professional people who are very qualified to do uh, the predictive maintenance tasks, because you will involve things that are a little too uh, high of a level and need a lot of experience, like for instance, uh, spectral analysis. You do, for example, for, for instance, uh, um, uh, chromatography or uh, uh, IR uh, uh, spectroscopy and so on to determine different, uh, um, uh, for example, chemical compositions of uh, materials and so on. So, uh, typically, it's going to be expensive. PDM, uh, pre predictive maintenance, is more expensive than preventive maintenance, but it can, it can predict the failures before they take place. Data collection, so PDM is quantitative in nature, so it doesn't depend on the opinion, it's not opinionated, it's d driven by data. Data are collected, analyzed, charted, and interpreted. Data collection can be time-consuming and costly. Do not collect data that is not going to be used. Uh, the reality is that a lot of times you will see manufacturers collecting too much information, they're collecting too much data. And there is a good reason for that is because uh, sometimes down the road um, they will discover that they need something there is uh, a trend of failures and then uh, they go back to the data that they have and some of the, the data that they collected they think that they never will use turns out for example to be important to know what is that uh, what is the cause of that failure or sometimes they will invent something uh, a new technology in the future that will rely on that data that has been collected and the information that they have been gathering can be used to uh, uh, calibrate or to uh, investigate the, 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 uh, the usage of uh, the new instrument and so on. The measurement instrument used itself can cause errors and create bias and lead to faulty conclusions. Of course, uh, this is, I mean, something, uh, you know, uh, always uh, take into account, for instance, temperature. You know, uh, temperature in the past, uh, in the last 100 years, 
the, the sensors, the, the, the instruments used for, for reading temperatures have been improved over time. Now they say that 100 years ago, these instruments were not. So, uh, data collection, basically, uh, fixed type devices are remote collection systems. So there's uh, two types of devices, uh, fixed and, uh, and um, uh, portable. The fixed type, basically, uh, they're installed on uh, uh, for uh, harsh environments. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, you know, some engines, some truck engines actually have uh, um, uh, a wireless transmitter that transmits data. Uh, this is an example of a fixed type uh, data collection. Uh, <clears throat> there's also the portable type, which basically uh, can be used from equipment to equipment, as you know. So, uh, data analysis now in in uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, how is it done it can be chemical it can be uh, engineering like for instance uh, mechanical properties and so on uh, statistical that is mathematical or of course it's going to be a combination of all of these the, anal the analysis outcomes must be compared with established uh, standards or baseline so uh, definitely that's uh, you have to compare it to control for example a con what they call a control experiment or uh, to previously set uh, standards and data. The trend lines and regression models, uh, they forecast the future equipment behavior. And uh, of course, uh, the history uh, is important to be, uh, to be aware. So uh, vibration analysis is one of the data collection methods. So uh, most operating equipment uh, experience some level of vibration. Most common causes of vibration, imbalance, misalignment, defective bearings or builds, loose bolts and harmonics. Uh, imbalance, of course, um, you know, balance of machinery is actually uh, is a very important thing, especially in, the, let's say, in the aerospace industry. As you see here, for example, this is the, an engine that the shaft, you know, uh, uh, for it is being balanced. There's also, um, so also, for example, uh, wheels, you know, the wheels, the car wheels, basically, they need to be balanced. What they do, they add, they add weights, or they sometimes they take off weights, you know, to uh, balance uh, um, a machinery. Uh, defective bearings, loose bolts, also very common, loose bolts, and uh, harmonics. So, uh, uh, harmonics, for example, um, basically uh, for 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 uh, AC machines, particularly AC motors alternating current motors. Uh, sometimes when you want to control the motor speed, use electronics, use electronic components like, for instance, uh, 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 transistors or uh, uh, SCRs and so on. So if you take, for example, transistors, for instance, like in, 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 uh, in variable frequency drives, the waveform that is generated is uh, uh, rectangular. It's a rectangular waveform, not sinusoidal. Now, a motor uses sinusoidal waveforms. They need, uh, AC motors need sinusoidal waveforms to run. And here's the thing. So, uh, when you generate, when uh, the uh, rectangular waveform is generated by an electronic component, basically, what happens is the motor only, uh, there is a theory, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, basically, it's called Fourier's theory. Uh, is a, for he's a scientist that lived in the 1800s. He says basically that any waveform, doesn't matter how, what the shape is, it can always be converted to pure sine waves. Uh, a series of pure sine waves. Now for motors, the waveform, the, the sine wave that has the lowest frequency, it's called the fundamental uh, frequency, only that waveform drives the motor. Okay? The rest... There's an infinite number of series of uh, sine waves that are generated. All of the rest are called harmonics. Now, these harmonics, they cause heating and they cause vibration in the in the in the motor. So they're actually useless. Only the first one, the fundamental one, is the uh, useful uh, wave. So uh, this is where harmonics come from. If vibration can be felt by human senses, this is probably too late. Some damage may have uh, taken place already. 
So uh, <coughs> factors affecting the vibration level, size, stiffness, and weight of the equipment, rigidity of the base and surrounding equipment. Yeah, this is actually uh, it's you know a lot of it has to do with the research on the basically uh, the mechanical models of equipment uh, with flexible or rigid uh, couplings and so on. Rigid means the the difference between them is that when you uh, a rigid coupling or a rigid uh, base basically uh, uh, it can transmit shocks. So if there's for example a vibration on this end. The vibration can be trans. It can propagate through the coupling to uh, the next component. But in a rigid, in a flexible coupling, uh, the vibration is is absorbed, or a portion of it is absorbed. And uh, actually, in mechanical modeling, if you study, you know, later when you take control systems, uh, basically they model this uh, in what they call um, uh, <coughs> spring uh, mass damper uh, model. So, for instance, if you have a rigid coupling, you you you, you can model it as a mass. Uh, if you have, for instance, a flexible coupling, you can uh, model it as a spring and a damper, and so on. So, uh, recyclocating equipment like pumps and compressors will have uh, generally higher acceptable uh, levels of vibration because they they vibrate more than uh, rotating equipment. Uh, obviously, there's a standard called uh, it's ISO standard 2372. It's an old standard. It was actually 19, in the 1970s. In 1996, it was replaced by standard 10816. Basically, that standard sets, uh, puts the, the guidelines and uh, how to monitor the vibration. Uh, basically, uh, it tells you that you will use a unit for uh, uh, yeah, what they call the, the vibration velocity. In, uh, in inches per second or uh, uh, millimeters per second. The standard is for equipment that have uh, that operate at uh, RPMs uh, less than 12, between 600 and 12,000 RPMs. So uh, vibration velocity is in inches or millimeters per second. A rotating equipment is a measure of the forces on the bearings. This is how they actually measure the, the, the vibration. Uh, the measurements have to be taken at the bearings. Uh, the, bearings, the, the main bearings basically that support uh, uh, the system. So we can actually measure the axial uh, vibrations along the axes. You can also uh, measure uh, what they call the, 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 um, the radial uh, uh, vibrations. Uh, to measure the radial, in other words, radial means uh, along the radius of the cross section. And to measure the radial basically, you can measure the you know um, left <clears throat> up and down or in and out of the system. So uh, these are three uh, measurements that need to be taken. Sometimes they don't take all three. Sometimes only the axial uh, or two of the three, um, uh, let's say, degrees of freedom. So uh, the standard that we saw. The ISO standard actually classifies the machines into four classes. Uh, class one for small machines, and then it pro uh, progresses to the large machines with uh, flexible uh, foundations. These are the, the, the four classes of machines. Here you can see in the book, actually, in the book uh, on page 89, uh, this actually this is uh, what the standard actually classifies the machines on. And you will see here the, the speeds. So uh, the vibration velocities, actually, I'm sorry, the vibration velocities in inches per second or millimeters per second, the range for each class of the uh, four classes. Also, the book will show you uh, a table that will show you the, the effect on the equipment of uh, different vibration velocities from 0.15 to uh, 0.90 uh, inches per second. So, for instance, 0.90, you'll see extreme high forces uh, bearing damage in a few days or a few weeks. Uh, this is at uh, the highest, 0.9 inches per second, which is very high. So, uh, it's actually a good guide, basically, to show uh, the, the effect of vibration on uh, uh, machinery. The amplitude of variation by frequency over time is referred to as the vibration signature. 
So uh, uh, the book will show you some examples. For instance, here uh, on the next slide, you will see here. So uh, this is the vibration signature for a piece of equipment. Look here, notice that it has been scanned, or it has been uh, uh, information has been con uh, collected from uh, about 1991 until 2001, over 10 years. Okay, it's a 10 year span. And uh, look at it here, it started at zero, apparently when it was purchased new. And 10 years later, the equipment started having vibrations at about 0.5 inches per second. And uh, which is relatively high actually. Here below the, the, the vibration signature, you'll see this, basically it will show you the spectrum of frequencies of each component of the components right so for instance here there's this here for example will tell you that there's a component one of the components in the machine that has that actually oscillates at a frequency of uh, for instance uh, what is that 10 kilohertz okay there's another component that causes vibration at 5 kilohertz so this actually is very good it's very good, useful information because it can tell you where the vibration is coming from so uh, this is the vibration signature graph. Change to the vibration signature signal a change in the characteristics of one of the rotating elements. So this is actually important here. So as you see, there is a change in the vibration signature. This change, as you see over time, is a result of something. So one thing about mechanical problems uh, is that the mechanical problem does not go by itself. So if there is a problem, if you hear something, then if you don't, if you take, uh, uh, if you don't uh, uh, try to fix it, it will never improve by itself. It will either get bad or it will stay as it is, but will never improve. So that's why you need to, if you detect the vibrations, you have to take a corrective action uh, uh, soon, or it will get worse with time. Okay, chemical analysis. So chemical analysis allows to study the internal conditions of the equipment. Analytical data show the level of deterioration and the type of contaminant in the lubricants, which point of rise causes and, and abnormal. So in other words, if you have a, a, a oil, for example, engine oil, of course, engine oil over time, you know, it, uh, it oxidizes. But in addition to the oxidization, you can find contaminants, contamination from, for instance, uh, um, uh, the steel. Uh, the steel in the in the engine. You can find also uh, contamination from, for instance, uh, um, gaskets or from uh, different components in an engine. So uh, it's very important, actually, uh, chemical analysis. Uh, um, some common chemical analysis techniques are spectro uh, spectrographic analysis and tribology. So spectroscopy, basically. There's a lot of types of spectroscopy. There's, for example, uh, infrared spectroscopy. There is UV spectroscopy. Here is the v UV vis or the visible range of the spectrum. Uh, there is also Raman spectroscopy. Uh, there's there's many types. There's even X-ray X-ray diffraction. There's uh, also uh, Rutherford backscattering. If you want to really really get to uh, find extremely small tiny amounts of uh, contaminant or so on so there's many types actually but the most common of them are the ir spectroscopy particularly and then probably the uv uv and the, uh, in the third place probably the raman raman spectroscopy so uh, basically what uh, they do in these methods they uh, basically uh, uh, they scan uh, a substance over the IR spectrum. Now the IR spectrum, uh, infrared basically, uh, starts from about 600 or 700 uh, nanometers. This is the wavelength. Uh, you know, the red, basically the, the red color. Then below the red color, uh, or actually the frequencies below the red color, will have higher wavelengths. So the wavelength actually increases as the frequency uh, uh, um, <coughs> as the, the frequency drops. Now uh, the range of uh, Typically, you know, in, in, in spectral analysis, uh, you can actually refer to the frequency, but most commonly they refer to the wavelengths. 
So uh, like when you do, when you do, for example, Raman spectroscopy, uh, it's more common to you to refer to the wavelengths of, you know, or, or the IR spectroscopy, we refer to the wavelengths. So uh, now uh, what they do, every chemical substance will have, or well, actually no, not every chemical substance, but every uh, um, um, molecular behavior will have a signature. Like for instance, uh, the OH band in uh, in for example in water for instance and in, in anything that has the OH like KOH and AOH uh, it will it has a, a characteristic signature several actually in the uh, infrared region so when you scan a substance if it has for example water in it you'll see like a spike at that specific wavelength and you can tell right away that this is from the OH for example Alcohol, the same thing. Alcohol will have its own uh, signature bands and so on. If you, if you find alcohol, you will see a spike at that specific uh, wavelength and so on. So they use this analysis to tell what the composition is, uh, the composition of the uh, material is. The amount of absorption and emission is characterized by uh, uniquely uh, for each substance. The presence of wear metals signals abnormal equipment conditions such as improper alignment, out of balance, uh, inadequate uh, clearances and so on so uh, let's look at this table here um, this will show you an, uh, a list of elements found in lubricant and possible so, so when you do the for instance a Raman spectroscopy or IR spectroscopy on for example oil and <clears throat> you will see wavelengths that indicate the presence of some ions for example, iron, obviously, if you see iron, that means there's a wear in the cylinders, in the gears, actually anywhere, really anywhere in the, in the engine box or in the, in the, gear, uh, in the gear box. Uh, chromium, rings and bearings, plating. Copper comes from brass, so the brass alloys will contain copper. Uh, in bushings, bearings, definitely. Uh, washers, friction plates, and so on. Uh, for instance, nickel here from valves. Actually, that's uh, you know valves and pipes. Actually, uh, nickel. By the way, nickel alloys are commonly used in the in the oil industry, in the crude oil industry. Basically, uh, the reason why because the nickel alloys resist con uh, resist corrosion a lot better than uh, other alloys in the oil industry. Uh, so uh, the reason why because crude oil has sulfur in it when it comes from the, the wheels actually there's a lot of uh, uh, sulfur content in it and uh, the sulfur the sulfur compounds actually what they do they they uh, uh, um, they corrode uh, steel and uh, 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 copper alloys and other alloys but nickel particularly is resistant to them so that's why you'll find it in valves and pipes and anything that that carries uh, oil uh, products. So uh, this is uh, basically uh, spectroscopic analysis. Tribology basically means the science, the study of uh, lubricants. This is what tribology means: the study of lubricants. Everything that relates to lubrication. So uh, the effect of frictional forces, uh, you know, and uh, anything that is related to uh, lubrication studied in, in tribology. Um, in the most favorable conditions, some surface damage will occur even when lightly loaded with, uh, with lubricated surfaces. That's why you know the lubricant will change its color over time. Uh, the main reason actually is because it will it will oxidize, but also because of the contamination from uh, you know the the metal particles that uh, get in it. <clears throat> so uh, thermography means measuring the temperature. Of course, now uh, there's a lot of methods, but uh, probably one of the, the best is infrared imaging, IR imaging. So uh, the reason why, especially for example, say in, uh, uh, in combustion engines and in uh, electronic circuits, is that you can tell where are the, uh, where's the, the heat zones in the engine. Um, so, uh, it's uh, very useful, actually. So, uh, IR is based on the fact that all objects at temperatures above absolute zero 
radiate infrared energy. This is, of course, this is scientifically uh, true. In fact, if if a body that is at 273 uh, uh, negative 273 uh, Celsius at zero at zero Kelvin, uh, if you have a body that exists at that temperature, it's called a cold body. It's a cold. Uh, it's a black body. Now, uh, but everything emits temperature if you have if its temperature is above uh, zero Kelvin. And uh, you can measure that temperature using what they call Planck's constant. Uh, Planck's formula, basically. Uh, you can use it to measure the temperature of anything, really, uh, virtually anything, uh, using Planck's formula. Of course, the, re the, the problem is if you use uh, Planck's uh, uh, method, Planck's formula, to measure the temperature, it will be less accurate than any other uh, direct method, like, for example, a thermocouple, for instance. Uh, so a pyrometer, for example, I, I think there's a uh, there's a picture of it somewhere. Anyway, so uh, yeah, a pyrometer uses uh, Planck's formula, but a thermocouple basically measures the temperature directly. So a thermocouple will be more accurate than using a pyrometer. So uh, Color thermographs are usually coded so that increasing surface temperature progress from blue to green to yellow to orange to red, and finally to white. Each color represents a, speci a specific range of uh, temperature. So, for instance, here, uh, this is a, a PC board. So you can see here where the core of the uh, processor is is white, which indicates a very high temperature compared to the surrounding uh, um, uh, electronic components. It's really good because uh, sometimes, you know, when you make a circuit, for instance, actually we encountered this last year, uh, I mean, yeah, last year, for a capstone project, for a theme project. And uh, what happened was that, actually we have also a video on, it for, on YouTube for the project. So uh, what happened was that um, uh, the students connected a circuit that contained uh, MOSFETs, a transistor called MOSFET. And uh, what happened was that uh, the MOSFET used to operate in a region in which that caused it to heat. It heats. So uh, it was difficult actually to end. The, what happens is that it breaks and uh, the circuit stops after, like, after operating for uh, like 20 minutes or half an hour. So uh, it was actually to run a pump. And uh, if you take a thermal image of the circuit, you can see actually where the heat is, is coming from. Of course, it was actually the MOSFET. The MOSFET was, like I said, it was getting hot. And uh, so we needed to uh, modify the circuit to, uh, to account to uh, basically to reduce the power handled by the MOSFET. <clears throat> so anyway, yeah, I mean, it's a really good uh, way to, uh, um, uh, to troubleshoot a circuit. Because, you know, obviously, you know, electrical circuits generally are more difficult to troubleshoot than mechanical. Uh, it's actually this is a good saying is that uh, electrical is more difficult to troubleshoot than mechanical, but it's a lot easier to replace an, an electrical part than it is for mechanical part. So uh, <clears throat> one way to troubleshoot is just to take a thermal image, and then it will show you where the problem is. If you see, for example, something hot, uh, a resistor that is hot, that means you need to increase the power handling capability of that resistor, and so on. It's also used, uh, like I said, everywhere in uh, here, for example, here, electrical contacts, as you see, these here are very hot, for example. Um, <clears throat> look at the core of the motor. You see the core of the motor here. It's uh, where the heat is, but on the outer surface, there's no heat. And so uh, it's really useful, actually, to for troubleshooting and, for instance, uh, leaks, uh, infrared devices, the way if you have, like, uh, you know, buried uh, pipes, and you want to find uh, a water leak, then uh, the cold, what you do actually, what they do basically, basically you can turn on either the hot water, uh, uh, turn the water to, very, to uh, you know, make it very hot, and then you can see the, the uh, with, with using a thermal image, you can see the, the water leak, where is it coming from. Or what you can do, you can turn on the water at cold, if it was, if it was a very funny day, you can just turn on the cold water so that you can see, you know, uh, um, the cold spots. Look at this picture here. It's basically for storage tanks. 
you can see if it's basically being filled with something uh, hot, for instance. And you can see here, this tank is actually where it's filled out, and this here is empty, for example. Uh, look at this here. This will show you where uh, the leaks from a house are, the heat leaks. Like, look at around the window here, uh, around the door, and uh, the garage, for example. So where there, this is where, you know, where we basically need to improve on uh, the installation, for example. So infrared is really useful, uh, it's uh, very commonly used in a lot of applications. Um, like I said, electrical predictive maintenance, uh, you can actually, if you see something hot, for example, you can tell that you need to replace it with something uh, uh, that has a higher ha uh, power handling capability, and so on. So, uh, ultrasound techniques. Ultrasound is also commonly used, but like I said, the infrared is actually better. It's better than ultrasound in many applications. Uh, you can use ultrasound, for example, to detect. Uh, basically, ultrasound means you hear. You know, uh, you you hear basically the the the. the, the uh, of course, not you. I mean, you have to use sensors, you know, to to listen to the ultrasound that are coming from, for instance, uh, a machine, or for example, a leak. So ultrasonic frequencies are shortwave directional signals beyond the normal hearing range. Um, okay, there's, uh, here's information that are important. They are uh, short wave. So the first thing, sound waves are uh, pressure waves. They are pressure waves. Uh, the sound waves, unlike the electromagnetic waves, light is an, electro is, is an electromagnetic uh, wave. Uh, sound is pressure. That's why light can propagate in space, but sound cannot, because sound needs air molecules to, pro to propagate. Ultrasound is just similar to sound waves, it's actually uh, uh, pressure waves. Okay? But here's the thing, uh, ultrasonic waves are directional. What does that mean? Directional waves means, uh, now when you actually talk, you know, the, actually the, the sound waves, you know, they, they, they they diffuse everywhere. Okay, uh, the ultrasonic signals, on the other hand, because they are very short wavelengths, uh, they are higher frequencies. So when you have something that is a higher frequency, that means uh, the wave's uh, length is smaller. As the frequency increases, the wavelength becomes smaller. Okay, so uh, ultrasonic frequencies have small wavelengths. Because of that, they are di they are directional. So if you direct <coughs> So, for example, uh, uh, um, they propagate into uh, longer distances, but narrow uh, place. So the space they occupy is actually narrow, but uh, a lot longer than the sound wave which actually propagates everywhere. They diffuse faster. There are many applications of that, actually, and uh, in the few next slides we can see them. So uh, another thing is ultrason ultrasonic frequencies are above 20 kilohertz. 20 kilohertz is the maximum frequency that a human being can hear. Typically, you can't hear actually up to 20 kilohertz. You'll hear up, up to probably 17 or 18 kilohertz at most. So uh, working equipment produce characteristic ultrasound frequencies or sonic signatures. So uh, we saw the chemical signatures. Of uh, some molecules, uh, examples. Now machines also produce sonic signatures. Did, uh, again, remember uh, an ultrasound is just like uh, a sonic wave. Okay, uh, so you need to bring something that a sensor that can hear uh, and, and the noise that comes from the uh, equipment. Now, if the noise is in the ultrasonic re region, as above twenty kilohertz, then you can't hear it. But you can bring a sensor that can hear it. Here's the good thing, as the frequency increases, it becomes more directional. It becomes more directional. In other words, uh, the ultrasonic frequencies, if you hear something, you can pinpoint where it's located at, because it's narrow. Remember, I told you it's actually narrow, so we can tell, you know, where is it coming from. Unlike the low frequencies, the, you know, the ones that you can hear, because in low frequencies, it's, it really diffuses everywhere. So uh, this is a good thing. So they make use of this uh, 
uh, property of ultrasound uh, waves to locate, uh, for example, uh, um, leakages in pipes. So, uh, or for example, the cause of the uh, of the noise. And if there's a change in the noise, that means there's something happened. There's something happened in the equipment. And uh, typically, uh, ultrasound frequencies will, uh, will they are emitted by leaks from uh, hydraulic and pneumatic pipes, steam traps, valves, and heat exchangers, as well as from electrical arcing and coronas caused by worm, uh, worn and frayed uh, conductors or shorts. Uh, <clears throat> potential bearing failures. So, what you can do before something fails and starts vibrating. To make noise, okay. Now uh, the noise in the ultrasound to come uh, way before the vibration takes place. So that's, so that's a good thing because you can detect uh, bearing failures by ultrasonic means before, long before vibration or heat detection techniques can be effectively uh, used. So before the IR or the uh, vibration uh, detection methods. So uh, like we saw, there's two main methods. Really, you can have a transmitter and receiver, something that transmits ultrasound, and a receiver that hears the, the 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 echo. And you can have you can just have a sensor that can listens that listens to uh, anything that that uh, emits ultrasound waves. So one technique involves a transducer uh, that emits high frequency ultrasonic waves towards an object, and then you measure the, the echo. This technique can reveal changes in material properties such as thickness, uh, pits, cracks, uh, voids, and corrosion. It can also reveal leaks in pipes or other containers. Like I said, this uh, if the if the pipe is buried, if the pipe is buried, it will not be you will not be able to use it. You can't use ultrasonic methods. You have to rely on infrared. But if the pipe is not buried, or if it's like closed, I mean, uh, buried under, uh, let's say, not a deep surface, you can use this, but you can also hear, uh, you can actually hear it. Uh, sometimes, you know, you can, it's better to use uh, uh, sensors, basically, that can hear uh, the, the low uh, frequencies than the ultrasound. The reason why, because the ultrasound, uh, it has wavelengths, it cannot penetrate through the objects easily, okay? Uh, the wavelengths, uh, the longer the wavelength, that is the lower the frequency, the wave can penetrate easier through the objects. Okay. So, uh, but one problem is that if you use the hearing method, in other words, if you use uh, sound sensors, uh, the problem is that uh, at lower frequencies, you can hear that there is a leak, but you cannot locate where is it. Because, uh, like I said, the low frequency can actually diffuse okay uh, unlike the ultrasound but the problem with the ultrasound is that it cannot penetrate through objects see so that's why it's better to rely on infrared techniques than on ultrasound if you have uh, something buried so uh, the second technique requires the detection of the ultrasound frequencies generated by a source ultrasounds are considered directional allowing their sources to be easily uh, located like i said directional Ultrasound frequencies generated by damaged or worn pumps, gears, gears, and bearings can be detected before vibrations reach detectable levels. This actually here explains to you how an application actually of uh, ultrasound is in audio spotlights in uh, in theaters. You know, so uh, basically, what happens is that first you emit the wave in ultrasound, then uh, uh, after a certain length. After a certain uh, uh, distance, uh, the waves become become longer, and then they become audible. You can hear them. So actually, this is how uh, uh, an audio spotlight works. Now, on contrast, if you emit sound waves uh, 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 from speakers, uh, they will diffuse all over, and uh, it will be noisy. You know, other people around you will hear you. But if you use uh, uh, this is the ultrasound, you can direct it towards the audience that you want. So this is an application of uh, ultrasound. And I think this brings us to the end of this lecture. Thank you so much.